now? Go on this fast. Deny something. Maybe you don't go on a five-day water fast, but maybe you don't eat till 6 o'clock one day. And see what happens when you replace your meal time with prayer time. Come on, let's replace our meal time with prayer time and see the Lord move in a new way in our lives. And fasting, man, it does not feel good. But I'll tell you what, when you come out of that fast, you start to see what God's revelation is dropping on your life. And you start to see some breakthroughs. You start to see the bondage of the enemy to be loosened in the name of Jesus. We're going to be coming from the book of Daniel. And so you all can read along with me once you feel ready and uh, feel the rhythm of the beat. Cool? All right. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed in them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring the palace of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. If I got a title for this sermon, it's a deep life is a strong life. Come on, I'm going to say it one more time. A deep life is a strong life. Father, in Jesus' name. I thank you for every person, every soul in this building. And under the sound of my voice, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would overshadow them. They would sense the peace beyond all understanding. Whoever is hopeless, may they find hope. Who's ever lost, may they be found. Who's ever going through monotony, may they be stirred up by the fire of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that your conviction, your encouragement, and your glory would rest in this place. We love you. We appreciate you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all may take your seat. Any arborists in the house this morning? Arborists? No hands, okay, it's all good. All right, so if you do not know what an arborist is, it's somebody who studies trees. And in my study, I came across two trees that I found some really interesting facts about. One of the trees is called a white alder tree. And a white alder tree is typically found beside riverbeds. And the fun fact is they can evaporate up to 400 gallons of water a day. That's a lot of water, y'all. But here's the thing. Because they are so near the, the water, the source that they need to live, their roots are really shallow. They only go down about five meters into the ground. And on the other hand, you have a desert zone tree. And their roots are very deep and very strong. And here's a fun fact about them. It's possible that they could live off of only 40 gallons of water a year. 40 gallons of water a year. So they take every drop of water that they can get, even in drought, 
and receive it. I want to testify to you all that I was like the shallow white outer tree. And when storms come in life, and I was thinking about what would it look like if a really big storm came across a white outer tree. Look at this picture on the screen. That could happen. The outer tree is not only a danger to itself, but it's a danger to everything around it. And so in my life, I became a Christian in 2014. I gave my life to Christ in college. I had some understanding of Jesus growing up, but when I first came to faith, it was quite shallow. I was still living insecure. I was still living unsure of who I was. I was still living in sinful habits that I had taken into my new life in Christ. And I was living defeated. And I would beat myself up because I wasn't measuring up in this life. And I wasn't, I, I felt like I wasn't making God proud. But there was a moment in 2016, and some of my friends in the building know who I was in 2014 and 15, smoking, drinking, whatever else. But in 2016, I went to the ENC conference. Pastor Marcus remembers this. He baptized me that day in February 2016. I can't remember the exact day, but there was a, at the conference, I remember being so fed up with my sin. And I said, God, I'm tired of trying to catch you. Can you just catch me? And I remember when I let go and I surrendered. That the Spirit of God came in a new way in my life. He took me to the deeper. See, sin didn't taste the same anymore when it happened. I couldn't, I was, it was driving me crazy. I couldn't even go to certain environments. Because the Spirit of God was revealing to me that he was all I ever needed. And he revealed his love to me in such a unique way. But it was because of the hunger and the thirst. And the reason of just being fed up with what the world was trying to pull me and take me away from my relationship with him. And leading up to this moment, I gave my life uh, to, to campus ministry to do it it's starting in 2018. And for the past few years, going through COVID and all the political upheaval and everything that's like, like that, like going through all of that, like God has been able to reveal things in me, and, and I've been able to examine my heart and lay things at his feet, and he's taken me from glory to glory and faith to faith, deeper and deeper. And this year, I, I, at the end of every year, I ask the Lord to give me a word for the, for the next year. And for 2024, as I was praying, he gave me the word strength. And I asked my wife, Gentlemen, ask your wives questions, and they are, I, I'm telling you, they will reveal things to you that are so encouraging, and I just want to celebrate my wife. I want to honor her. She's been my, she's been my greatest help in this life, and so I just want to celebrate her in this moment. I'm so grateful for her. I asked her, how have you seen the Lord working strength in my life this year. And she said this simple phrase, you keep showing up. That's it. You keep showing up. It's simple, right? And I want to encourage you all today, this morning, as I dive into the book of Daniel a little bit, to be where your feet are. You're here at church right now. You've showed up this morning. Don't think about what's happening 30 minutes from now. Don't think about what's happening the rest of the week or the rest of this year. God has a word for you, and I've been praying for you to receive it this morning because I believe your life is going to change this morning. If you feel like, man, I, I, maybe I'm good with the Lord right now. Well, he wants to take you higher. He wants to take you deeper. If you feel like you're going through a monotony right now and just the, 
the, every day, like, man, I'm waking up just trying to get to the next day. Well, he wants to spark you up and, and reveal his love even deeper to you. And if you are like, man, I'm on wit's end right now, he is going to snatch you up right now and save you from your turmoil. And he's going to be that ever-present help in time of trouble. So there are three traits that God revealed to me about a strong life. Remember, a deep life is a strong life. And those three traits are commitment, consistency, and courage. When we look at Daniel, he intensely lived out these traits. To give you a little bit of context of the book of Daniel, um, it, Daniel was in the, is in the Old Testament, and this was during Babylonian captivity. See, the Israelites, this wasn't the first time that the Israelites were in bondage and slavery. A thousand years prior to this, they were in slavery in Egypt. And they were crying out for God to rescue them. See, God loved them and had chosen them. And that promise still stood. So God, what he did is he raised a leader, Moses, out of the Israelites to free them and lead them out of Egypt into the promised land flowing with milk and honey that God had for them. So Moses led them out of Egypt. The ten plagues happened where God showed up supernaturally. And then they went through the Red Sea. And all the armies of Egypt were crushed by the waters. And they're like having victory. They're celebrating God. And then God takes them through four to six. He, God in, was intending to bring them through four to six weeks of the wilderness before they got to the promised land. But guess what happened, y'all? They raised up an idol. And worshipped a, a golden calf while Moses was talking to God on Mount Sinai. And God could have destroyed them. God had every right to, to start over with the new people. But his mercy stood. And in those four to six weeks instead took 40 years. And God wanted to reveal three things to the Israelites. Humility, spirituality, and faith. Humility to show them that God was the one who brought them victory. Spirituality, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And faith, the Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, will provide for all their needs. So now we get a, a thousand years, generation after generation after generation. Israel was asking for kings, and these kings would rise up in Israel, and there would be uh, idolatry. There would be wicked kings that would rise up, and idolatry would happen, and they would be worshiping false gods. And so the, the curses of Deuteronomy that we read about fell upon Israel in that moment because they kept forsaking the Lord, their God, their first love. And there, there was an, enough had to be enough, and then now... God, uh, now God had brought them into captivity once again, into Babylon. But God had a remnant. God had a chosen people, even in the midst of a people that did not want him anymore. So we get to Daniel and his three friends, and they were the most impressive in Israel. And so the first point I want to bring to you is that Daniel was committed to God. Let's read verses 4 through 5. Go ahead and put that back up on the screen. It says, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. See, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, verse 5, the king assigned them a, a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to totally reprogram them into Babylonian culture. And he wanted to soften them by whining and dining them at the Lord's table, at the, not the Lord's table, at Nebuchadnezzar's table. And what's interesting is, you know, you think about, like, that time period and all the, all the rich food that they could have indulged themselves in, Daniel and his friends, where everybody else was eating scraps or just terrible food or just, just the, the same things every day. I mean, think about luscious table of, like, all the greatest foods and delicacies. So that's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to just indulge them into. And so 
my question to us is what are we attempt what are we entertaining that is attempting to soften us towards God, uh, not towards God but towards culture towards the world toward the ways of the enemy toward the ways of hell there are so many things that are being thrown in our faces all the time but here in verse 8 let's read verse 8 It says, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. And so Daniel made a predecision, a commitment to God to walk in his conviction. A deep life is a strong life. See, Daniel drew the line of resistance by training his appetite. Daniel drew the line of resistance by training his appetites. And so we are responsible to train our appetites and passions by drawing the line. I mean, our culture, we have physical, intellectual, spiritual, relational passions that are, that are in our faces all the time in our culture. And God is saying, will you draw the line of resistance So that you would stand against the ways of this world and not be conformed to them. Because we are a set-apart people, a holy people. We are his bride. And we are to not be stained by the world. We are to live deep lives and strong in Christ. Not looking at the ways of this world like, man, I'm not going to go to the gym and try to look like I'm strong and be strong because I look like it. My strength comes from the Lord, the maker of the heaven and the earth. I thought somebody would get excited about that. I'm not hearing anybody talk to me. Come on now. See, maybe we need to do the same. Maybe we need to start denying ourselves some food. Because there's a lot of poison in the food these days. GMOs. Seed oils. Come on, you don't want me to go on my rant. So, I just want to hit on the, the power of fasting real quick. We got a fast coming up as a church um, here in about a week and a half. And I would love to see 100% participation. Because there is so much power in denying your, yourself when it comes to your stomach. I heard Miles Monroe, this preacher, say one time, he said, how are you going to overcome the power of a demon if you can't overcome the power of your belly? Right? Come on, you can clap there. Right? That wasn't me. That was, yeah, that was the Holy Spirit through him. So, uh, with the fast as well, the heart behind fasting isn't just to mortify the flesh. That's not it. You see, Jesus answered the Pharisees when they asked him a question, saying, why do your disciples not fast when we fast? And Jesus said this, they need not to fast when the bridegroom is with them. But when the bridegroom leaves, then they will fast. Our fasting is a deep longing for the return of our Lord. It's a deep longing to make room for the Holy Spirit to move in our lives in a unique way. If you feel like you're living a shallow life right now, Go on this fast. Deny something. Maybe you don't go on a five-day water fast, but maybe you don't eat till 6 o'clock one day. And see what happens when you replace your meal time with prayer time. Come on. Let's replace our meal time with prayer time and see the Lord move in a new way in our lives. And fasting, man, it does not feel good. But I'll tell you what. When you come out of that fast, you start to see what God's revelation is dropping on your life. And you start to see some breakthroughs. You start to see the bondage of the enemy to be loosened in the name of Jesus. So what is God calling you to commit to? I want to transition to a moment where I had to understand what God are you calling me to commit to when it comes to strength in this season of my life. And I had to know my values. I had to know my values. And the the way I could know my values was to know who I was. I was asked this question one time, why did God create Robert Chudy? 
Have you ever asked that, so yourself that question? Why did God create you? You could give a good Christian answer, right? But it's got to be a deep place in the, 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 the secret place of your soul that God has to speak to you in order to understand your values and commit to them. And so God revealed this phrase. He said, Rob, I created you to worship me as a son. That's it. And it seems basic, but it's so deeply ingrained in the, the, the entity of who I am. I just believe that if we know our identity as sons, as daughters, and we, and we worship out of a place of that, we're going to start seeing miraculous things happening in our city, our state, and our country. And this church is going to shine bright as the light. So number one, commitment, just to give you five of them in my life. God's word and prayer. The word of God says, seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness to know that all things will be added to you. See, you can look at God's word and prayer as a daily habit, as a daily discipline. But if you just look at it as a discipline alone, you'll miss it. See, prayer and devotion and, and, and reading God's word is a matter of love. Do you remember the first time you fell in love and all the crazy things that you would do to try to get to that person? Do you remember all the time you spent thinking about them? The moments you were alone with that person? And how that stirred your heart? Jesus spoke to a church in the book of Revelation in chapter 2, and he said, you've done all the good things. You've done everything well, but I have this one thing against you. You've forsaken your first love. Maybe God's calling some of us today to run back to our first love and to rediscover the meaning of devotion. Because if you look at it as just a discipline, it'll be shallow. It has to be a matter of love. Love for our King, love for our Savior, love for our Lord. Next value, health and fitness. Many of you know that it is a, health and fitness has been a big journey of mine in my life. And I will tell you that my fitness journey started from a place of insecurity. I wanted people to look at me and be like, man, that's a hard worker. Man, that dude, he's got it going on. Because I wanted people's approval. And I was doing it for the wrong reasons. And so many times we've fluctuated. Maybe it's like, I want to get healthy. I want to start exercising. I want to start lifting weights. I want to start eating healthier. And we go good for a while, but then we just drop it. It's because I believe that if we do it from a place of godliness and desiring to honor God as recognizing this is the temple of the Holy Spirit, he will allow us to commit to it and remain committed to it and consistent to it. And so we have a wellness campaign coming up. Many of y'all will hear about this. And I want to see 100% participation in that as well in our church. Maybe you've never been exercising in your whole life or it's been a long time. We have a beginner place where you could just start walking and moving around every day. And you'll have a coach encouraging you and challenging you as well. You'll have an, we'll have intermediate a uh, place where you start lifting weights and seeing the benefits of that. And then you have this advance where the, the fitness freaks will be at. Okay? And they'll, be, they'll have coaches too. But I just, I just believe that God wants to do something new here. He wants to take us deeper in our health and fitness. Not even just our word and devotion because it's all, it all becomes one. Right? How we see ourselves, how we look at ourselves in the mirror and we're not ashamed of who God created us to be is so important. Next, marriage and family. These are more outward commitments. Marriage and family. My wife right here is my best friend. She is my go-to person. And my duty is to lead her and lead my family by laying my life down for them. So I've committed to my family. I've committed to being present with them. One of the disciplines I'm trying to do is take my phone at the, when I get home from work and put it on the counter. And just be there with my kids. Because I know in the season that I'm in right now, with a two-year-old and a <laughs> two-month-old, <laughs> a 
newborn, a newborn. The, this is going to go by real quick. And so I want to be there and be as present as possible when, it, when it's the time to be. It's all good. God, give me grace. Last two, church and ministry. Uh, I want to, oh, it's hot in here. <laughs> church and ministry. I'm committed to keep preaching the gospel. Keep preaching the gospel. Committed to you guys, committed to this church, and committed to reaching the lost. And that's all of us as Christians. We're, we are anointed and we are called to go and proclaim the good news of the gospel. And last one, friendships. I want to have deep, meaningful friendships. They get in my business. That are guys that are checking me. And willing to come and confront me when I'm out of line. And I'm tripping. And it's happened. And I'm grateful for them. Not looking at anybody right now. So. <laughs> and I also want to have friendships that are fun. Like, that is, like let's have fun again, y'all. We were kids one time. We were like, I look at my toddler. He's had fun. You know, you gotta tell him that fun. He just go, you know, out in the pool a hundred miles an hour. Whenever he sees like an open body of water, he'll jump right in. He's just having fun. Anyways, let's have fun. And then lastly, there will be. Uh, this is not a commitment, but just to sum everything up, there will be test days. There will be test days that God will send us to really test our commitments. And here's where I see Daniel overcome the test days and succeed over them. It's because of his consistency. Daniel was consistent. Let's go to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. This is, uh, this is around when Daniel was 80 years old. So you kind of fast forward after uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. This is under King Darius. And Daniel was still a high authority in the kingdom of Babylon at that time. And in Daniel 6.10 it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. So to give you a little context, there was a decree because there were some jealous people in Daniel's life. They couldn't find any fault in Daniel. And they wanted Daniel out. And so what they did is they saw that Daniel worshipped Yahweh, the God of Israel. And they hated that. So what they did is they went to King Darius and said, Darius, mighty king, you know, put a decree out that for 30 days we worship you alone. And if anybody else worships another god, let him be thrown into the lion's den. And so Darius was like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'll do that. And so he set this decree up. And even in knowing that this decree happened, Daniel was consistent with his commitment. In the face of fear. In the face of possibly being thrown into a den full of lions. Do you all understand that? Have you been around a lion at the zoo? I have. It's really, really scary. Okay, so imagine a bunch of lions in the den where there ain't no cage. Okay, so think about that, right? <laughs> your strength is determined by your consistency to your commitments. Your strength is determined by your consistency to your commitments. I also look at consistency and I think of the word pattern. And when you look at the word pattern, the root word uh, pat, I thought of the word paternal. Father, when there's a father present, like our father in heaven, when a father knows who he is, he brings secure leadership. He brings security and safety to a room. Then when people are lost, like the sheep that Jesus talks about, the lost sheep, the, he left the 99 to go after the one. There is a secure man, there is a secure father that runs after us. And is willing to lay his life down to protect us and to bring us up and to make us new again. And so I believe that our consistency is like a pattern of security in our lives. That we can, we will, we will shine as a light for people who are lost and need help and are crying out. 
As much as we need to train our resistance to appetites, we need to train ourselves in what we enjoy in Christ. And so th- those consistencies that we have, we want to train ourselves in what is good in Christ Jesus. And notice that I'm saying training, not trying. There's a difference between trying to be committed and consistent than training to be committed and consistent. Because when I think of training, I think about it's okay to fail. It's okay to not be perfect. But it's you showing up. It's you showing up every day and being where your feet are. It's you coming to church week after week. It's you coming to small group week after week. It's you approaching the secret place in devoted prayer and worship and in the word of God consistently in training yourselves for godliness. Craig Rochelle says this, successful people do occasionally what average people do consistently. But I want to rephrase that. Deep people do consistently what shallow people do occasionally. And I remember, guys, what it was like to live occasional, what it was like to be shallow. I was shallow looking at women. I was shallow looking at the word of God and God himself. I was shallow with sin. I was shallow with trying to, to live for the, for the word and, and shallow in community. I, I had enough of being shallow. And I need to be committed and consistent to being right before the Lord. Daniel was committed and consistent, and that created courageousness in his life. It all ties together. Daniel was courageous, my third point and my last point. Daniel had confidence in the fear of danger. Mark Twain says, true courage is not the absence of fear. It is the mastery of fear. True courage is not the absence of fear. It is the mastery of fear. We know that there is going to be temptation to fear. The spirit of fear is rampant in our culture. And I feel in the spirit that they is stirring up even more. The spiritual warfare is getting even heavier. And if we listen to me right now, Listen to me. If we do not get right before the Lord in our secret place, we will cower in fear. And in a world that is going into turmoil and chaos, which the Bible prophesies about in the last days, there will be perilous times. We need to stand confident and courageous in the face of fear and not let it cower us. Come on, do I have any saints in the building willing to testify that they will not bow down to the idol of this culture. They will not bow down to pornography. They will not bow down to the sexual the, the sexual immorality in our culture. They will not bow down. Let us be courageous in these times. See, Daniel was courageous to tell and interpret the dream Nebuchadnezzar had. The Nebuchadnezzar said, if anybody comes to me and tells me the dream that I had and the interpretation of it and gets it wrong, they're going to be destroyed. I will kill them. But Daniel waited on the Lord to reveal the, the revelation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And, I rem- I, and I'm thinking about Daniel opening the scroll of Isaiah and reading, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. See, Daniel knew that waiting on God was trusting on God. And that's where his strength would be found. And ultimately, his commitment, consistency, and courage would be birthed in that place. Daniel was also courageous to follow his convictions to not partake in the king's table as well. When we we talked about earlier in chapter 1. And then lastly, his friends They faced the fiery furnace to not bow down to the idol that was erected when Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't worship me, if you don't worship this golden statue, you'll be thrown into this fiery furnace. And he turned up that heat four times more than it actually was. And then they were thrown into that fiery furnace. And there was a man who appeared. And that man is the angel of the Lord. And we believe today the angel of the Lord was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Come on, somebody. It was God who brought them deliverance each time. I was out here um, on Friday morning uh, just praying, 
for you all in the sanctuary. And I, I came out, and my wife does a small group on Friday mornings uh, for mothers. And shout out to anybody, any mother is interested, you should come to that. Uh, so come talk to her if you are interested in doing that. Anyways, um, Kaylin and her children uh, were with Ezra, my son. And this sanctuary gets like pitch black when the lights aren't on. I mean, it's like crazy pitch black. And the door was a little, was open, and they were like creeping in and out. They were like, oh, scared. Oh, nope, I'm scared, I'm scared, <laughs> right? And so I was like, okay, well, let me like walk up there with them. And so like all of them held my hand, like as I was walking in there, and they were like, oh, it's cool, it's cool, you know? And so God was revealing something to me in that moment, that like when in the presence of the Father, there's safety, no matter how dark it seems, no matter how, what it looks like around you, even if you can't see what's in front of you, the presence of the Father gives you safety. And there was a moment where they let go of my hands and they started running through the aisles. And maybe, you know, Brad, if you're, on, you're, on, if you're in the building right now, maybe this isn't good that I'm sharing this right now. You know, it's a safety concern. But hey, it's working out. And so... So they felt free because even when I was in the room and I wasn't attached to them like so closely, they still had that, they knew that my presence was there. And so when I thought about being strong and courageous, I thought about the book of Joshua. When Joshua was uh, Moses' mentor and Moses would go up to the mount and talk to God and Joshua would be in a tent. And it says that when Moses left the tent, Joshua remained in that tent. And I can't help to think that when we read about in Joshua chapter 1, when the Lord says, be strong and courageous to Joshua, that he was hearing that same word when he was dwelling in the tent of the presence. And so Joshua knew that the presence of God is what brings him strength and courage. And there's another man that I have to talk about, that he is the Messiah. He is the one who was prophesied about. He was the one who was committed, consistent, and courageous. See, Jesus was committed to the Father's will and is now committed to interceding for the saints on his behalf and our behalf. Jesus is consistent because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. See, Jesus is courageous because he faced God's wrath and took on the sins of the world. See, Jesus in John 18, 4, on the night of his betrayal, stood up in John 18, 4. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them and said, who are you looking for? See, Jesus was scorned 30, scores 39 times. They mocked him. They despised him. They spit on him. They beat him. They placed the crown of thorns on his head. They forced him to carry his execution stake. They stretched him wide and hung him high, nailed him with three spikes because he willingly loved us and laid his life down for you and me. He rose on the third day with all power in his hand and all authority and said, I am the King of Kings. Come on. Come on. Come on, who are we celebrating? Who are we worshiping? Come on, he's the risen Savior. He's given us life and life abundantly. Come on, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Be strong in him. Know that you're committed. Know that you'll be consistent. And know that you'll be courageous when you're in him, living deeply rooted in him. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ. He's our Lord. And salvation is a free gift. And I believe that some of you in this sanctuary today have not committed yourselves fully to the Lord. And there's an opportunity right now 
to receive the gift of salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, not of your own works so that you may boast. Will you receive the gift of salvation today? And if you're in this room and you just, you're like, Rob, I know I'm saved, but I need the fire again. Well, I'm going to pray for you, and that fire is going to come upon you. And you're going to change as soon as you leave this room. And you're going to have a new mindset, because you are a son or a daughter of the Most High God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We worship you. Lord, salvation is today in this room. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have moved mightily. I pray for commitment, consistency, and courage to mark this church. And Lord, that every individual would know that you see them. You see them. You know exactly where they are. You know every thought they have from afar. You know that they're about to, some of you are about to give up, but God is saying, stand up. Raise your head high and look to me, the King of kings. Don't look to the hills. Look to me. Look to me, for you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. Lord, we worship you. We adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate God.